How's it going? Welcome. Uh, nice to see you all here. This is this is my first proper stream, which is uh, exciting, a little bit terrifying, actually. So I guess those of you who are watching, who've seen my other videos, you will get to understand the value of editing. So I've um, just been having a little look through. There are a, uh, a few different questions already popping up. I will do my best to kind of monitor the chat happening here because uh, there's, you know, there's plenty of questions coming through and I'll pick a few. So today we're going to talk about brewing at home. And I guess that's brewing at home. Uh, if you're a coffee pro, that's maybe talking about how to help customers brew at home, maybe. If you just make coffee at home and you want to chat, ask questions, then we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. I guess we're going to run uh, maybe half an hour. Is that, you know, if it, a little bit longer if you guys have loads of questions and you want to keep going, we'll go a little bit longer. But I'm figuring like half an hour is probably, it's probably pretty good. Um, so I'm going to get in there. And firstly, thank you all for coming down, watching. Uh, there's quite a lot of you here right now. That's a little bit, a little bit terrifying. Now, quite early on, Nick Whiteley asked a question, which was how to train your palates to tell the difference between bitter and sour flavors. Um, and actually, this is a, kind of a big deal because bitter sour confusion is is a known thing in uh, the taste world, right? There's plenty of papers on it. If you Google bitter sour confusion, you find a lot of people um, confuse the two. Now, sour is actually pretty simple. Sour is simply the presence of acidity. If you want to get right into it, your, your tongue measures free hydrogen ions crossing uh, barriers, and that's how it, it detects acidity. Um, there's lots of different types of acidity that do taste different. Um, the simplest thing to do with that is is like um, think about stuff like like fruit. Fruit is probably the easiest, most fun place to get acid without really much in the way of bitterness. So lemons, oranges, grapefruits. Uh, well, grapefruit's a little bitter, so I'd cancel that. Uh, apples, pineapples, everything like that. That sort of uh, fresh feeling down the side of the tongue. Now, taste maps, tongue maps are wrong. You know, you have taste. Uh, receptors for the, for everything all over the tongue. So pretty much go and buy a bunch of fruit, taste it. In terms of bitter, actually tonic is a particularly good uh, benchmark for, for, for kind of bitterness. And there's a very cool experiment you can do. If you get some tonic and you get some table salt, it has to be real, no, no, uh, iodine salt, iodine salt. Slowly add the salt to the tonic, stir and taste, stir and taste. For most people, the salt will begin to suppress the sensation of bitterness, which is kind of fascinating. Um, all right, I'm getting detracted. That isn't about home brewing, but but just go and taste a bunch of stuff. Taste a bunch of fruit, um, and then yeah, when it comes to coffee, under extracted tends to be more acidic. They're very difficult to get these days. Over extracted or very dark roast is going to be full of bitterness. All right, let's jump into some brewing questions. And and uh, Manny Mac did post uh, what's everyone drinking right now. Feel free free to to throw into the chat what you're drinking. And if I'm talking too fast, you you just say because we've got a lot to cover but I, I don't want to talk so fast that it's kind of, you know, too intense. So let's have a little scroll down. This is stuff I was going to talk about. Well, we can start with some questions here. Um, Scott H asks if there's any reliable cheap method of measuring TDS at home. No, not really. Uh, refractometers are pretty much the only way to do that accurately. Uh, there are uh, refractometers that are cheaper than others, um, and there's tons on the internet about using cheaper refractometers in order to get good coffee TDS readings there. Uh, Socratic Coffee, I think, did a whole bunch of stuff with that one. Um, if I miss your question, feel free to ask it again. I'll, I'll try not to. Uh, interesting question here, which is, uh, in terms of flavor, what's the difference between drip and immersion? I don't think you can necessarily tell the difference between drip and immersion. Primarily, the, the filtration method is always going to have the biggest impact. Going from one extreme, which would be metal filtration, which might be a French press, which might be a, a metal cone, uh, might be the, the little metal disc you can get for AeroPress, they're going to let through um, all the soluble material and then a bunch of unsoluble material tiny pieces of coffee often. So you tend to get a fuller, richer, heavier mouthfeel from metal, metal filters. Um, and then at the other extreme, you've got paper. So your, your kind of classic paper filter and different papers have different thicknesses, tend to clean up papers, uh, sorry, they tend to clean up coffee a different amount. Chemex papers, for example, are super thick. I don't really like them. I don't really love the Chemex. It's another story. Um, and then in the middle is cloth, which people have mostly forgotten about kind of for good reason, because cloth is so hard to maintain, right? Like you, keeping cloth tasting good is quite difficult. 
it's very easy for cloth filters to taste like the washing that you forgot from yesterday in the machine smells. That kind of like disgusting, wet, wrong, kind of foisty smell. Cloth filters, sorry, can develop that really easily. But cloth filters are probably my favorite filters from a, a mouthfeel perspective because you get like lovely clarity, but just a little bit more texture, like a little bit more body. I competed in the World Brewers Cup and I basically did an immersion brew filtered through cloth. Um, and I was, I was pretty good. I didn't win. I came, I came second, but it was a good time. It was, it was like a, as, a, as a kind of nice marriage of methods. What I would argue in terms of drip versus immersion is that immersion is just like a little bit easier to, to do a good job with. It's a little bit easier to, to do an even extraction with because all the coffee is pretty much being treated equally. Whereas if you have a, a drip brew, that's percolation waters passing through coffee and that passage may not be completely even down to like a pouring kettle or at the extreme of espresso and like a pressured channel. Okay, um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to catch up because this, you've asked a lot of questions, which is kind of amazing. Um, okay, here we go. Um, ba, 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 ba. Do I like the coffee from Round Hill Roastery? I do, I like the people too, which inevitably, you know, it kind of goes hand in hand. They're lovely, and if you, if you know them, say hi. Um, where are we getting to? Okay, I will slow down, Faith. Sorry, I'm speaking too fast. Let me, let me just, let me just dial it down. I'm not drinking coffee, because that would not help. At this time of the day. Okay. Um, so, there's a question asked uh, uh, to talk briefly about water. If I'm honest, water is the single biggest frustration for me as a, as a coffee professional. You know, as someone who, who roasts coffee and sells it to people to drink at home, water is probably the biggest barrier between them uh, having the experience that I want them to have, between you know, them getting the taste notes that are on the bag. The basics of water, uh, and water's hugely complicated, and it's not really a simple answer. There's been tons and tons and tons of work done on, on kind of best water for coffee, and it's always kind of a range. Uh, I would go with, uh, you know, the, the SCA's guidelines have been around a really long time, um, which are, you know, about three degrees of calcium off the top of my head. I want to say like around about 50 to 60 parts per million, uh, but then a matching alkalinity. Now, someone's going to catch me out on this, but I feel like it's in the region of like 40, 50 parts per million. And, and you, so you have these two main constituents of water, right? You've got the minerals. And then you've got the buffer. And Maxwell Colonna Dashwood did a bunch of work on water for coffee because he was very frustrated that we were really just talking about water from a TDS perspective, a total dissolved solids, which is kind of, that's the total of what's in here, but not what the constituent parts are. And he did work on like how different minerals affect extraction, right? So, so magnesium, if you have the same amount of magnesium as you, in one water as calcium in another, they'll extract differently. They'll have a different flavor profile. And then if you don't have enough buffer, if you have too much buffer, that'll go from being kind of harsh through to being just muted, bland, boring. Like the alkalinity is, is the buffer. Realistically, in our homes, you know, the, 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 the best thing we can do is either harass our local coffee businesses to give us water to brew with. Most good cafes have RO on site. I see no reason that they couldn't give or sell for a tiny price some of the water that they use to brew. You know, take a two liter empty plastic bottle with you, take some water home for the next couple of days. I don't think that's a ridiculous thing. If you live in London, filter it as, as hard as you can. Like Brita filters generally will remove some taste and odor and reduce the hardness a little bit, but they're not, they're not fantastic. And then you're stuck with like bottled water, which ugh, yeah, it's good in terms of you can buy bottled water with the right kind of mineral contents, but I'm not really super into, you know, buying endless plastic bottles of water. I put a, a sort of semi-commercial filter on my kitchen tap because I'm a little bit weird and I, I can, but even that, you know, it, it's, not, it's not an ideal setup. It's not nearly as good as the water uh, at, at Square Miles Roastery that for a while I used to take like a five liter jerry can home every, whatever it was, 10 days or so to, to drink with. So, phew, water's kind of a nightmare. 
um, what I would recommend in terms of the best to choose is, is something that's probably close to what the roaster is using, right? So email your local roaster. They absolutely will know what their water's like. And if you're going to try and buy a bottled water to match that, that should be pretty doable if you've got their specs. But that, that's what they'll be benchmarking against. Okay. Um, how would I recommend storing coffee? Dark, dry, airtight. Right? Don't put it in the fridge or freezer. If it's, if it's a small amount, you're gonna get through that pretty quickly. Um, certainly don't leave it open in a fridge because they're extremely dry places uh, and coffee can absorb any odors in a fridge. Uh, so Tupperware, if you don't have a, a, a bean storage jar, the little zip seals on bags are pretty great. And then, yeah, just put it in the cupboard. As long as your kitchen isn't crazy hot, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Um, scrolling down. This is good. I hope you're having fun. Uh, what are my thoughts on tonic espresso? It's okay. Uh, I, I actually prefer uh, what Gareth, uh, who's the trainer at Square Mile, does on a hot day, which is filter coffee and tonic. Uh, I tend to find the bitterness of an espresso chilled down just, just to push the drink out of balance for me personally a little bit. So I, I kind of like a filter tonic mixture. I think that can be very delicious. Um, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm scrolling down. You got a lot of questions. Um, so, Sam Ting asks, if my grinder has less than ideal distribution, what is the best way to improve that? It depends how wasteful you're willing to be. One of the, the best uh, improvements to have is to take a domestic sieve, which um, usually a, a domestic sieve, the, the holes are about a millimeter, uh, so a thousand microns if we're doing that thing. If you sift out the big bouldery pieces from your coffee, that will definitely, definitely, definitely improve the taste of the cup. However, depending on the quality of your grinder, that might be 15, 20% of the coffee that you bought and ground. If you're worried you have a problem with fine pieces, you wanna do a quick hack. Get some um, kitchen roll, some kitchen paper, lay it out on the table, pour your ground coffee onto it, and then sort of smush it in, like rub it into the paper. And that causes all the little fines to get trapped in the kitchen roll. When you shake off all the grounds, you'll end up with a way less fines in that mix. Taste that, see if that's improved your cup of coffee. Both methods are, unfortunately, a little bit wasteful. Um, okay. Clever Dripper, I, I would love to do a, a Clever Dripper how-to. Uh, that's, on, that's on the list of brew guides. Pour over is still first and on the way. Um, oh, this thing jumps me around here. Okay. Uh, can you brew espresso with an AeroPress or is this a myth? This is a myth. Espresso, if you want to get into real, real espresso, espresso requires really, really quite high pressures. It's, it's, it's um, nine bars is typically what a coffee machine will be pushing water throughout, which equates to about 130 pounds of force per square inch. Now I did the maths briefly on, on the square, the size of an AeroPress puck and the amount of force I can apply to that. And uh, I can get a little bit over a bar of force, right? So you, you just can't match the really, really, really high pressure of espresso brewing with your, with your hand, with your body. You just can't apply enough force across a, a pretty big puck of coffee, bigger still than an espresso basket. So, so no, not really. You can make super delicious coffee, but I would argue, no, it's not espresso. It will never really have crema because you won't reach the kind of pressure you need to, to super saturate the, the liquid with CO2, right? At high pressures, um, water, hot water can absorb way more CO2 than it can at low pressures. And what happens in espresso brewing is when the water's traveling through the puck of coffee, it soaks up a lot of CO2. But the moment it escapes the basket, it goes back to being an atmospheric pressure and it, it can't keep the CO2 in solution anymore. And it comes out as a tiny bubble, lots of tiny bubbles. Those get caught in the coffee and they form a foam and that's basically what crema is. It's the CO2 that, that uh, water can no longer keep hold of. So to answer the question, uh, no, you can't make espresso with an AeroPress in my opinion. Um, What's my approach for dialing in new to me coffee? Scott H, can you clarify that one? I'll have a look later down. Do you mean with espresso, like dialing in at home espresso wise? And I'll answer that if that's the case. I'll, I'll check for your answer in a second. Is the V60 superior to the Chemex? 
I'm not going to go with superior, I might just state my, my preference. I probably prefer the V60 to the Chemex. I don't really love the Chemex papers, and Chemexes really easily get a little airlock where the paper perfectly adheres to like the cone, and some people use the chopsticks method where you, you, you kind of create a little air gap so that, that you know, air can get out and water can go in. So I'm not, I'm not a huge Chemex fan. They're very beautiful. I'm glad I own one, but I'm not, I'm just not crazy about a Chemex. Um, Matthew asked, what's the best, this is, this is where editing is a beautiful thing. Uh, what's the best brewing method to highlight bright fruity notes in coffee? It's a really good question, actually. Um, I tend to prefer those kind of coffees paper filtered, for sure, just clean and vibrant. Uh, I tend to find, for me personally, that, that a little bit more sediment or, or insoluble material can mute things, even if the texture's nice. As for brew method, I don't think, I don't think you can say conclusively this one is better than that one. Um, I think there might be techniques or other things. You might want to brew, for me, a little hotter. Make sure your water's really pretty hot with a light roast like that to get a, to get a good full extraction. Um, and then maybe brew a slightly quicker side. Slower brewing tends to round things out a little bit more for a similar TDS. Um, so, yeah. Jeff, you ask about pour over specifics. I, I am working on a pour over video, so a lot of that will be covered, I hope, in the future. Sean, you ask what the best grinder for pour over is for a thousand or less. A thousand what? Euros? Pounds? Dollars? I mean, it's all getting scarily close to the same thing. You know, it's a, that is a really good question because that is a kind of underserved section of the market. Baratza are making some grinders in that kind of a price point, but not a lot of other people are. There's a bunch of espresso grinders there, but there's not a lot of filter grinders there. And I think for a long time, very few people have wanted to spend that much money on a grinder that really just does filter. Because I don't think there's really any grinder that does both super well. Let's stay away from the EK43 as a topic because that's a three, whatever, 3,000 pound, euro, dollar grinder. Um, but there's not a, not a lot there. I would certainly check out some of the, the Baratza stuff. I hear the latest version of the Sete is, is working much better, but that's really still an espresso grinder, I think, first and foremost. Um, okay. Someone asked what my opinion on, on coffee distributors are. I haven't used them a ton. I've never been an enormous fan of them. I I haven't seen an enormous improvement in in quality, but for me, my you know demands are slightly different. I want the quickest, easiest, laziest way to a really great espresso. And for me, for the extra work, I haven't necessarily seen the uptick in quality or consistency. Other people's experience may vary. Um, so. Um, Uh, Kang is asking again about, about water. At the moment, besides third wave water, besides Kalana's project, there's, there's really not a lot. We haven't been a vocal, interesting market for people to sell water into until now. You know, really only in the last couple of years has water been like a hot topic that people have really wanted to get into. So no one's really selling product or water to that market yet. Um, I don't hate the Chemex, by the way. Uh, Jakob, I'm just, I'm just not, I'm just not super into it. Okay. Um, Error Museum, I hope I answered your question, which is no, you can't really mimic espresso with an AeroPress. Um, Adam D, I, I have a bunch of data. Uh, I, I've had a, like a thermocouple and a data logger inside uh, a bunch of different V60s, and I will publish that data to determine how much of an impact uh, the material has, and whether or not a preheated plastic is better or worse than a preheated glass or metal V60. Um, so that's coming in the, the pour of a video. Maddie Mac, should there be a Michelin star system for cafes and roasters? No. Uh, mostly because Michelin is a stupid, corrupt, um, limiting, unhelpful, uh, biased, organization that I don't really rate 
Um, you know, I think it's pushed so many restaurants to be something that's not in their core DNA that I would hate to see it do the same thing to cafes. I think we already have a, a lot of issues with cafes not really truly expressing themselves and, and having a really distinct personality and then setting a bunch of criteria that they should jump through. I think, I think we'll unfortunately push cafes to be more homogenous and more boring, which is the last thing in the world that I would want to see. I would want something that sends it the other way. That isn't home brewing though, I'm, I'm, I'm getting off topic. Okay, um, wait, I saw an answer to a question. You've asked a lot of questions, I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best on these. Uh, damn it, I just lost where I was. This, this chat thing is a killer. Um, okay, uh, I feel like someone said yes, it was dialing in for espresso. So I'm gonna answer that. How would I approach a coffee to dial in for espresso? I tend to start with a fixed recipe. Now, my recipe is a little bit more than two to one. So I'll, I'll probably start with a dose appropriate to the basket in my machine. I keep an 18 gram basket in my machine from VST. So I'd probably start at an 18 gram dose and I would probably start at a, a minimum of 40 out. So a little bit more than twice the weight of the coffee in. Two to one is a good place to start for most people. I just, I like a little bit more length in my espresso. It also gives me a little bit more uh, clarity and extraction, which I, I value. So I'll pull that to maybe 28 to 30 seconds, right? I'll dial in my, uh, grind till I hit that rough kind of brew time. And what I'll do is I'll have a set of scales, I'll weigh my in and I'll brew and time how long it takes to get to my output weight, right? And I'll adjust my grind until that takes 28 to 30 seconds somewhere there on, on a typical setup, which is uh, at work, it's a, it's a Black Eagle. And then I'll taste it and uh, I'll, I'll make some decisions there. If I wanna play with the, the, the dose, it, it, I'll make a few different decisions. If I'm desperate to, to make a quick change without um, wasting much coffee, then I might use the dose of the ground coffee, right? I might uh, dose it up a little bit to try and increase strength and, and maybe uh, change the recipe that way. If I've got tons of the coffee to work with, I'll tend to keep my dose in pretty fixed, right? And then just adjust my output weight using my grind, using time uh, to explore the coffee a little bit. By and large, if my first sort of on recipe shot is a little tart, I'll just push that same shot with the same grind setting uh, a little bigger and let it run to say 32, 33 seconds just to see what uh, using a bit more water does to that extraction. If I feel that the shot's a little empty, then I'll probably straight away jump to the grind, knock it a little finer, pull it a little shorter. At some point, I, I, am, I am kind of lazy. Um, oh, I'm a little bright though. At some point, let me go. At some point, uh, I, I kind of will write off a coffee. I'll, I'll assume at some point there's a roast issue. And maybe that's because, you know, as a roaster, I'm constantly looking for roast issues. That's the kind of biggest thing on my mind is what may have gone wrong with this roast. That's what I'm trying to assess uh, rather than, um, you know, the, the espresso particularly. But that's kind of my mindset. It, it's it's um, get to a good solid starting point that I know typically works with most pretty soluble coffees and then make some changes to try and improve that uh, by just messing with the extraction, primarily using the ratio of, of water to ground coffee. Um, okay, someone asked if I have any tips for barista competitions. Um, one of my next videos, I'm gonna do like a, like a director's commentary style thing of my World Barista Championship performance to kind of talk you through what I was trying to do, what I was thinking. Uh, hopefully there's some useful insights in that. Uh, Alex, when I say kitchen roll, I do mean paper towel, yeah, kitchen, kitchen paper. Um, okay, here we go. Linton Chiswick asks a really good question, actually, which is, if your taste is towards a conventional Italian style espresso, is there a way to make third wave roasts work for you? In my experience, they make good milk drinks, but only darker roasts make you a good espresso. So by and large, unfortunately, not, not easily. There's not much you can do with a lighter roast of a higher grown, more aesthetic coffee to have it mimic that, that uh, typical Italian profile. Now, uh, Italian espresso's history comes out of a mixture of, of uh, their colonial past to some extent, coupled with the fact that they were not a wealthy country during the boom of espresso. Uh, Post-World War II, when espresso really picked up, they were not 
you know, uh, the, the greatest economy on earth. And so the coffees being bought by Italian roasters were cheaper coffees, ultimately. And, and they were Brazilian naturals, they were robustas, coffees from Indonesia, all of which happened to also be relatively low acidity coffees. Okay, so that's the sort of where the original espresso style kind of came from. It was the coffees kind of available to them and that set the expectation of espresso to be a relatively high bodied, reasonably bitter, but kind of low acidity, full on thing. Uh, the kind of raw materials used by a lot of third wave companies just, just won't work. We've had a real issue in, in meeting the demands of people like you, because we felt that if we took those kind of raw materials and, and roasted them to the point of being uh, a little lower acidity, that we'd have, we'd have burnt away some of the stuff that we loved in them that we bought for them. I think some companies are starting to give a little, and, and there are certainly some specialty coffee companies trying to do more developed roasts, sort of darker roasts. Um, I, for fear of seeming like I'm, I'm, I'm throwing shade on them, I'm not going to name anyone right now, but um, certainly like have an explore of the different roasters in your neighborhood and chances are a couple will be doing something a little bit darker. Chat to your barista, ask if they've got something a little lower acidity, a little bit more body, and they may get you something really well grown, something traceable, something with a slightly perhaps better ethical standard than a lot of coffee going into Italian espresso blends but that may then suit your palate. So uh, that's a great question. Um, whew, how often should you deep clean your espresso machine and grinder at home? Joseph, that's a good question. I, I, okay, espresso machines work this way. The less often you use them, the, the dirtier they get in a way, right? Because after you pull a shot, if you don't rinse that machine out, whatever residue is in there will sit probably for 24 hours and either cook or just go stale. So if your, your daily routine is pretty tight, I would back flush with chemical. I would go every day, right? I just want, I just want that machine sitting clean the whole time at least every three, four days, get a little, just a little bit of chemical in there. A um, bunch of good ones out there, a bunch of organic, non-toxic ones out there that all work very well. But, but really, it cannot be too clean. The idea that you have to season a coffee machine, I think, is, is not true. Grinders, a little bit different, and it depends how comfortable you are deep cleaning your grinder. There are a bunch of grinder cleaning products out there. I think Mark Koenig made one called Grinds that works pretty well, that binds up some of the stuff that accumulates around the burrs. If you're pretty comfortable taking it to pieces, um, then I would say a deep clean every couple of weeks is probably plenty. If you're pulling quite a lot of shots, if you're making quite a lot of coffee, then yeah, weekly would be a good idea. But um, again, you know, you just don't want stuff to build up. You don't want oils to turn around it and, and start to contribute negative flavors. There is no downside other than the time invested to, to cleaning a lot. Um, there's a question. Um, on the Londinium R, I have not used it. People seem to like it, but I'm afraid I can't offer you any insight. Um, Gagad Satria, if I say your name wrong, I'm really sorry, asks, how do I achieve a consistent brew every day? How are you brewing? And I'll try and come back to that. Um, Will, I haven't used the Nanopresso very much, I'm afraid. Um, and Aaron, I don't know the Bellman stovetop milk steamer. Um, I'd be interested what kind of challenge you're having with it. Is it just not powerful enough where you, you struggle to get a good kind of motion? Steamy milk is about sort of two phases. An initial starting phase where you want the tip of the steam wand right on the surface of the milk, where you hear that kind of slurping sound and you're injecting air, you're kind of dragging air into the milk. Once you've added the air that you want, you should do no more adding of air. And ideally, you should do all of the adding of the air before the milk feels warm to the touch if you're steaming in a milk pitcher. The second phase is really all about churning. That's about texture. The, you don't want to add any air because those bubbles will stay kind of big. What you want to do is churn as much as you can. Just spin, just see that milk roll and spin around. And that knocks the bubbles down to be smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And the stronger, sorry, the smaller a bubble is, the stronger it is, right? So your, your milk foam not only feels nicer to drink, but will last a lot longer. This bubble size is really tied to its strength. Um, so Aaron, I don't know the issue you're having, but just technique wise, just make sure you're trying to whip in any air right, right, right at the start. And then you spend 70% of that time just using the steam to swirl the milk around. 
Okay. Um, which kind of ties to Kevin's question. How would I steam heat milk froth at home? Um, what, what, what tools do you have? If you go and check out the, um, if you Google Chef Steps uh, mocha pot, there's a, there's a quick demo of how to brew a mocha pot, and we also talk about um, making foamed milk in a French press. And we pour a little latte out with it. It's not my greatest pour, I'll be honest. But, you know, it's, it's an interestingly effective way to make not terrible milk foam at home with a French press. Um, how do you convince a local specialty shop to hire you part-time as a full-time student? Um, you know... I don't know what the barrier to that is. Lots of places need part-time people. Be willing to do all the jobs that need doing. Be keen to do all the jobs that need doing. All the cleaning, all the less fun stuff. If you're there and you just want to just learn about coffee part-time, that's less valuable to that business. Being there to help everyone else make that place run smoothly and spend as much time as you can around that learning, that's much more attractive to people. Okay. Um, okay, Scott, I... I, I now need to answer, having seen that you wanted me to talk about darling in a new pour over. So that, having answered espresso, I should now answer pour over. Um, really, uh, that's just grind, right? Like I have my fixed recipe. I brew 60 grams per liter. Uh, so I, at home, I tend to brew a 45 gram to 750 in the morning uh, as the sort of family brew. Um, and then essentially I'm just using the grind setting. and. The, the best tip I can give for quickly dialing in is go as fine as you can until you hit this sudden wall of bitterness. And when it suddenly gets bitter, like one morning your brew will be like, oh, oh. That one step coarser again is pretty much the sweet spot for that coffee. You'll be getting maximum extraction without starting to get some of the bitter, unpleasant stuff. So that's definitely the way to go. Okay. <sighs> Proper, oh, okay. I, I'm... I assume that's Niall there with the who do I look to most in the coffee industry. Um, that's a great question, which we're going to save maybe for an industry discussion. This is about brewing at home. We're going to try and keep it on brewing at home. Um, I don't know the Star Esso, Iqbal. I, I feel suddenly like people want to be able to throw links in here so I can just check stuff out. Does the amount of water used to bloom coffee affect the brew? Um, okay, so yes. Sort of. You need to use enough water that you are confident that all of the coffee gets wet at the start of the brew. Okay, so for that reason, I'm also very pro stirring my bloom because what's critical to me is that the coffee all starts blooming or starts brewing at pretty much the same time. The old school method that I learned first, which was the kind of very delicate pour with the pouring kettle onto that nice bed of coffee and you'd sort of wait for it to seep through, meant that the, the coffee on the top of that bed started brewing probably 15 seconds before the coffee at the bottom of that bed. That's not okay for me. So you want to make sure that you have enough water to completely wet all of the coffee when you stir it. For me, double the weight of, of coffee as water is not quite enough often. Uh, especially if I don't have a super delicate pouring kettle. So I tend to use between two and three times the weight of the coffee, but I just want to make sure that all of that coffee gets wet, that it gets a good stir. Uh, that's really, really the important part for me of blooming. Um, okay, there's a question on coffee ratios. Now, a lot of people think in the, the 1 to 16, 1 to 17, 1 to 15 kind of thing. My brain can't do that uh, because I'm not always the smartest person, especially when I haven't had that much coffee. So I think in, in terms of grams per liter. There is no right answer here, right? There is, there is, broadly speaking, there's good and bad in terms of extraction, but in terms of a recipe, that is entirely about preference. I prefer typically 60 grams per liter, which I think is about 1 to 15, 14, 15. I don't, someone check for me. Um, but if you prefer stronger, that's totally fine. You know, it's, it's about finding the kind of preference you like. I know how strong I want my cup of coffee to be for me to enjoy it. I know that I don't really enjoy coffee above a certain strength and below a certain strength as a filter coffee. But, but that aside, that's the, that's the key kind of important stuff uh, when it comes to ratios. Um, okay. I'm just going to scroll down a little bit. Um... Someone asks, uh, what can one do if a light roasted coffee still tastes under extracted and not sweet at 21.5, say? Um, 
Yet Not Dead, you're asking about, about you know, you're doing a pretty good job extracting it in the setup you have, and it still doesn't taste sweet. At that point, probably, the coffee may be at fault. It may not be an adequately developed coffee. It may not have the sweetness that you want in it. If you're confident that the raw materials are good, if you've cut them or tasted them, and, and then you're still getting this issue, then I'd probably look at, um, firstly, at your water quality. Does it match you know, the roaster's water quality? And then secondly, potentially, at um, the, the kind of the grind quality. Now, this is some work I really want to do, and it's, it's actually a great way to, to sort of test the quality of a grinder. Now, when you brew a pour over, those, those grounds absorb some water, right? So if you put 500 grams of hot water into a pour over, you won't get 500 grams of coffee out the other side, right? Because those grounds will soak up approximately two grams of water per gram of coffee. Right, so if I did 30 to 500, 30 grams of coffee, 500 water, I would expect to lose at least 60 grams of water to the, to the coffee itself, which means that maximum out, I should have like 440. Realistically, you're probably gonna get close to like 432, 435. Grinders that produce tons of fines um, absorb way more water, right? The, the surface area of the coffee does impact how much it absorbs. And if you start to get say 420 out, chances are you've got a grind issue. Similarly, if you get more water than you expected out, you're getting sort of boulders and unpleasant pieces. So that's a quick kind of check on that kind of a thing. I hope that uh, answers. Um, okay, I've got so many questions here. Um, Auto exec says I should try the Flare Espresso Maker. Uh, one arrived today. Look for that in a future video. I've never played with it before, but I'm super excited to, to play with it. Um, Eric, you ask, when I'm using my V60 at home, it often turns out kind of bland and I can't achieve the same flavors as my local shop. See if you can get some of that local shop's water to take home and try that. That'd be the first thing to check. Just ask them for like a bottle of their brewing water. They will be able to do that if they're not I don't know, this is family friendly, so I'll use only nice words. If they're not cool, that's a problem. But if they're cool, they'll just give you some brewing water to try. If you, you know, and, and see if that helps. If not, probably then grinders may be an issue. Um, Gwilym, what does spinning not spoon mean? I'm, I'm confused. Uh, and nice to see you here, hanging out with us. Have I reviewed the Breville BES 920 dual boiler? Um, Jason, I've used it a couple of times, the one without um, the grinder built in. It's pretty stable temperature wise. Uh, it brews well. I don't have any issues with it. I think it's nice. I haven't, I, don't, I think they have a new version out with a touchscreen too. I'm, I'm not sure. But Breville are quietly putting together some pretty solid espresso machines. I am overall pretty impressed with them. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. There's so many questions. I feel, I feel like I'm, uh, I'm, uh, just losing all sorts of stuff here. Uh, Jonathan, the hair is not perfect, but one day we can dream. Uh, okay, Will asks, how long should I wait before using coffee that was just roasted? Um, with espresso, this is probably a bigger deal because that rapid outgassing is, is definitely a challenge in an espresso brewing environment. So I, I tend to prefer stuff at least at least five days old. Bearing in mind the, the conditions that you store coffee in do affect this quite a lot. Um, that if your coffee is kept very cold, it will take longer to kind of degas and age out a little bit until it's easy to brew. Very fresh coffee is just difficult to extract, uh, which, is a, which is a kind of frustrating challenge. With, with filter coffee, I don't mind as much, right? Because blooming helps a little bit. It's just less of a pressured environment, less of a pressured brew. Uh, I don't mind coffee three, four, five days old and onwards from that point. That's kind of fine by me um, in, in terms of waiting. I don't want to wait that long. But yeah, espresso, a little bit different. different. Um, someone asked what I use to calculate uh, extraction. I do use the VST apps in... in um, uh, the, the, uh, I was a beta tester. For, for Vince in, in terms of VST products, I, you know, I got to test the very first refractometer. I got to test the early iterations of the VST baskets. I have long been a fan of his work. Uh, I am not paid to say that, but I do, I do like his stuff. So I tend to use his apps and all that kind of stuff. 
would I recommend freezing coffee beans? If I was to go away for, for a couple of weeks and not want to, you know, I've got some great coffee at home, then yes, absolutely. I would pack that up airtight, put it in Tupperware, seal it down and freeze it. Uh, you know, freezing it properly like that will do it no damage and it will certainly help extend its lifespan. There are people experimenting with kind of like getting the coffee in, freezing it all, and then pulling it out and, you know, grinding it frozen. The the paper on frozen coffee, I, I didn't think was as compelling as people seem to think it was. And as I, as I recall, they were, you know, they were freezing at incredibly low temperatures that are not, you know, realistic to replicate in a domestic freezer. Um, but yeah. That's uh, that's that. I'm I'm okay with freezing on the condition that you you you, you know you're not gonna um, you know be using that coffee regularly. You know if you're going away, you want to keep it. It's a pretty good way to go. Uh, only forty likes. I mean, if you want to throw some likes my way, you know I'm not gonna be you know one of those YouTubers that's like you know smash that like button. No, I don't want to be. I don't want to be that. It's so tedious. But if you want to subscribe, that would make me feel good. Uh, it's very motivating. Subscribers are very motivating, but the kind of begging for subscribers that is that is kind of, I've done it, I don't feel good about it, but you know, if you wanna feel like you wanna throw that, it's up to you. You do you, that's cool. Uh, Ryan O, are all E61 group machines equal? No, they are not. Um, yeah. Uh, Josh Lynn 100, please can you tell me where I got my glasses from? These were in, Disclosure. These were a very kind gift from a glasses company called Bond of London. A uh, guy who runs that, sorry, Bold, 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 not Bond, Bold, my brain. Bold of London. Uh, they're super great. These are custom set. Uh, I love them to death. He's amazing. Um, I'll throw him that. The uh, Gwilym, okay. This, so, Gwilym Davis, Wilbur's the champion. Love to see you in, in the chat here. Uh, I was talking about stirring a, a bloom. I definitely prefer to stir a bloom. I prefer a stir, well, in terms of the swirl, that's for me at the end of the brew where I'm trying to knock coffee off the walls of the V60, uh, where I'm happy with a little swirl. Scott's, I think Scott's got the name now. I, I feel like we've, I've talked about it with Scott. It's now the Rao swirl, but you know, I'm not gonna say it's the Hoffman swirl, but that's another thing for another day. But but I definitely prefer to get in there with a spoon for my bloom, for sure. Or, I mean, uh, and the little bamboo things are kind of fun, but a teaspoon is probably fine. Uh, just make sure with both the bamboo and the spoon that as soon as you start brewing again, you just rinse off any coffee from that uh, from that spoon or bamboo thing, because otherwise it's just, it's just sitting there, not brewing, feeling left out, and that's very sad. Uh, and it's, a you know, not insignificant quantity of coffee to just have bought and then not brewed properly. So, you know, rinse that thing off clean. Uh, George asks, when are we gonna have a Q and A on roasting? I mean, it depends who's answering the questions because I am not a roaster. I mean, I love the process. I am fascinated by it. I drive the roasting team at Square Mile crazy with my interest in it, but I am not a roaster and I should not pretend to be one on the internet. Um, so my roasting Q and A would be pretty uh, light on substance because I'd just be very nervous to to sort of talk too much on a subject that I don't feel is mine to talk about. Uh, maybe I can get that team, the Squirmar team, in, and they can do the Q and A. They will probably hate that as an idea. Um, someone asked about the Mocker Master. What's my view? I love the Mocker Master. I had one for quite a long time. I. I uh, definitely prefer the ones with the, the carafe, the thermal carafe and not the hot plate. Don't like a hot plate. I will say, and this is not just Mocha Master, why is it so hard for people to make a carafe that pours nicely? Because the, the Mocha Master, that awkward, just the pour is never good. It's the Wilfa ones, that's not great. The Breville I have at home, not that good either. Um, just kind of drives me a little crazy there. Okay. Um, but overall, Mocha Master, great brew. I tend, to, okay, brew tip, I tend to close the basket. So it's got it's got open, half open, and then closed, right? So I brew closed to start. I let maybe 250-ish mils in, and I give that a good stir initially, and then another stir as I open it, just so I get some immersion at the start, uh, and a really nice even extraction of that bit, and then I don't mind the percolation flowing in behind that. So um, that's, that's me. Um, would I see a benefit in selling retail coffee in smaller package sizes? Um, 
it's a really tricky one because uh, we, so Square Mile, we just sell in approximately 12 ounces, which is 350 grams or 341 exactly. We don't do that. Um, that's my preferred size because it's good for espresso, it's not frustrating, and for, for a lot of people, it's a kind of nice amount. What I would probably recommend doing is um, if you struggle to get through it, buy that 12 ounce bag, take half out, freeze it, right? Something airtight into some Tupperware, into the freezer, it will be fine while you get through the other half of that bag. Um, but yeah, I, you know, if you, if there's loads of roasters do smaller sizes, I've seen down to like 150 grams in some places. Um, but yeah, uh, okay. Just trying to catch up on this chat. A lot of chat, it's very exciting. Uh, can home users properly do justice to Geisha coffee? Dan, yes, yes, Geisha, Geisha is just an interesting variety to me. It's light and it's delicate. I would, it's expensive, right? And that's the bit where I'm like, oh, it's a lot of money often, um, which is interesting because it's certainly not a scarcity thing anymore. No one really asks why it's so expensive now. Um, but if your water is good, if your grinder is good, then you absolutely you can enjoy that coffee. Uh, and it'll probably be way cheaper per cup than buying it at a cafe that's trying to make some money on that. So I don't see why not. I would probably go for something like a French press, shockingly, check out my French press technique video because it's super easy, you'll get a really nice extraction, it's very hard to mess up, and it'll taste pretty great. Uh, Han, thanks for saying hi, hello. Uh, okay, um, what are my thoughts on espresso blends being brewed as filter? Uh, I like it. I, I'm not against blends in filter coffee, and actually, um, I'm, I'm, I certainly are espresso blends. I've definitely brewed them all as filter and enjoyed them as filter. Sure, Red Brick's a little bit more developed than I would typically want in, in a filter coffee, but I think they can be really delicious. I really do. I really, and Sweet Shop especially, I think is a really lovely filter coffee blend. Uh, James asks what camera I'm using. It's a GH5. Um, Sal, thank you. Um, uh, Isoroku asks, I want to take part in my local AeroPress championship. Do I have any tips? Pick a recipe that you can do consistently. That sounds like a weird thing to say, but the amount of times I've judged AeroPress championships and, and one cup has crushed, just crushed the first round, been fantastic. And that competitor has gone to the second round and I just can't tell which is their coffee. You know what I mean? Like it was the best thing I tasted all day, that first cup in the first round, but that, you know, whatever they were doing was a kind of inconsistent method that meant that it didn't manifest as being uh, amazing the second time around. So, you know, that's, that's, that's a kind of big tip for me. Um, practice, 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 you, and practice under conditions of competition. Lots of people kind of think about what they want to do, but never run a full practice session. Competitions are super weird because you're suddenly doing something you've never done before, which is make a coffee in front of lots of people and it throws you, throws you off. So practice that time compression, practice freaking out, practice screwing up. Biggest tip for barista competition, whether it's whether it's Brewers Cup, whether it's the WBC, whether it's AeroPress, practice making a mistake so you know what to do should you make one. How are you gonna make that time back up? How are you are gonna uh, get something tasty on the table? Um, oh man, I just lose these things. Uh, Filippo, thank you very much. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, hey Ollie, I'm not gonna say smash that like again. Um, which entry level espresso mean would I recommend? Hassan, I don't, uh, give me a budget. Um, Cause that's difficult to do. And, and really it depends what you want from espresso at home. Do you want just the ability to do it or do you want to, do you want a hobby, right? Do, do you want to have fun making espresso at home? Have I got a chance to play with the Mellow Drip? Uh, no, I backed it on Kickstarter. I am patiently waiting for mine, like I suppose everyone else is. Um, it's a little kind of pour over shower made of glass, I think, basically. Um, I, they, have they shipped yet? I don't know. Did they ship? Anyone? If anyone has their Mellow Drip, let me know, but I, I can't remember if they've shipped, but I have backed it, um, so I'm, I'm excited for mine. Of the available pour over brewers, which is my favorite. Um, it's it's a review that's on hold because they're not available in the UK yet, but the Breville slash Sage Smart Precision E, whatever it is, I love that thing. They lent that to me. I've been trying to buy it from them, but they seem to just, I don't know, no one sent me an invoice yet, but I will buy it from them. Um, that brews up to 1.8 liters. It does, it does a flat bottom basket. It does a cone shaped basket. It can adapt to V60s. It does different temperatures, it's stable. 
I was really impressed by that brewer. I really like that a lot. Um, but you know, bear in mind that yes, they lent it to me. I haven't paid for it yet. I've had it in my house for six months. Um, you have to declare these things. To declare these things. Um, Easy E, we're gonna do one. We're gonna do a, a live stream Q and A on business soon. Um, so like business questions, we'll, we'll hold those. I'm trying to I'm trying to keep vaguely on the topic of brewing at home. I don't know how you feel I'm doing on that, but I'm trying. Um, best cup of coffee I ever had. I can't answer that question. I can answer the worst one in a heartbeat, which is kind of also one of the best of my life. But but the best, I don't know. I think I'm still waiting. I've had like monumental cups. I've had like really like, whoa, interesting, wow, moments. Um, one that stands out, um, if you've been in coffee a while, you'll have heard of a, a, a automatic pour over machine called the Clover. Right, which was which was bought by Starbucks, I think, like seven years ago now, and that kind of kickstarted a lot of by the cup brewing in cafes. And I went to Clover's factory in two thousand and seven, um, and the lovely David Latourelle was working there, and he he's now uh, with Beacon, and uh, just the best. And he brewed one of George Howell's coffees. It was it was a Kenyan coffee called Mamuto, and they brewed it like crazy hot with this totally different like mesh filtration screen, and that was. So good. It was just the most vibrant, juicy, ha, huh, kind of uh, cup of coffee I, I could remember. That was really impactful for me. And that same trip had some really fascinating cups of coffee. I had, uh, I, I had a shot of espresso at Stumptown that was just really delicious while chatting to a guy called uh, um, Joel, who was roasting there at the time. He now owns Panther Coffee, I think, in, in, in uh, Florida. And it was a delicious espresso. And then he dropped afterwards that it was decaf. And that was one of those ones where I was like, I had no idea decaf could just not taste like decaf and just taste good, which was horrific because it meant that I could no longer get away with the idea that decaf could be an acceptable compromise because it can't be. Like if the decaf sucks, that, that's, that's, there's no excuse for sucky decaf. It can be fantastic. It should be fantastic. And I feel sorry for decaf drinkers. They, they're drinking it because, um, you know, they, they like the taste of coffee. They're not even in it for the caffeine and they usually get the worst tasting beverage. I think we're mean to decaf drinkers. Um, Martin, okay, thank you for the mellow drip thing. I will chase them down. I did, I did, okay, maybe that's, I, I had a, okay. I think, uh, I think it's been returned to them because I was away when it was delivered and I think it got returned to send it. I'll chase it up. Um, Iqbal asks, any tips on brewing coffee beans that are past its peak taste wise? No, I mean, you, your, your raw materials are everything. You know, the, the, you can't improve upon them dramatically in any particular way. Uh, once they're stale, they're stale. Once they're flat, they're flat. You know, there's nothing really we can do to revive them or undo the damage done by time. Um, so I want to ask you a question about manual grinders. Um, I've used manual grinders a bunch. I've traveled with them, obviously I've traveled a lot and it was nice to have something with me. They're hard work. You know, every time I do it, I'm into like a three week trip and, and that I'm just not super into the, the, the grind. What I'm going to do is um, I'm going to get kind of the top five uh, sort of hand grinders and I'm going to do a side by side in a future video. That's that's something I want to do. I want to get some of the expensive ones if someone will lend me one of those, like the Commandantes. I'm going to get a Zazen House, some Hario stuff. If I can get some of the Orphan Espresso stuff, I will. Though I, they're kind of a separate league. They're, they're made by Nock. I just don't know enough because I haven't used them side by side. You know, I've used Apollex, I've used Harios, I've used Commandantes, I've used Dustin House. I've had a reasonable time with lots of them, but I, I, I'm interested to kind of put them through their paces side by side. So one for the future. Um, okay. Uh, Errol Mark, would I like to come to Turkey? I would love to come to Turkey. At the moment, I'm not doing very much traveling. So, um, Thank you, but I'm kind of I'm kind of home for a while. Tim asks about the decent. Uh, I love the decent. It's still wrecking my head. And and if you if you follow Scott Rouse's blog, and you'll see his crazy profile that he put up, that's just insane. Um, that's just been wrecking my head. And um, uh, you know I, I I'm thinking maybe we could do a stream. Um, 
John, the founder of Decent, is coming to London soon. I might try and rope him in and we can do a little live stream together. That might be fun. We'll see. But I, I, I know I owe you more videos on that. I am getting to it. Uh, life, I, you know, this is not what I do for a living, unfortunately. I wish this was some days what I do for a living. Not that I don't love what I do for a living, but, you know, it's, it's hard to kind of find the time in and around all of the dumb things that I do for a living uh, to, to, to make videos. So this is kind of a fun way to spend ooh, nearly an hour with all of you. Um, all right, we're, we're holding steady. There's, there's a good amount of you, you here. Okay. Um, I'll try and answer like um, a few more questions. Isoroku asks about the 4-6. Uh, yes, I have tried that method. It throw, if you don't know it, it's a V60 pour-over method developed by the World Brewers Cup champion. Uh, a lot of people have very good results with it, actually. So it's certainly one I would recommend people try if they've had some frustrations with the V60. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I am working on pour-over stuff. Um, okay. Let's, uh, okay, I'm gonna go, we're gonna go, we're gonna go five, we're gonna go five more minutes uh, because I've talked for an hour now, nonstop, which is not something people should be allowed to do in this world. Ooh. Okay, Andy, uh, Andy Gate asks, if I could only buy supermarket beans, what would you buy? Andy, are you in the UK? If so, um, Union hand roasted are available in lots of supermarkets. I would only buy whole bean coffee. Um, so in most supermarkets, Union are available. If you shop at a Sainsbury's, uh, Modern Standard, do some uh, nice stuff. I think we're going to start to see a few more specialty roasters leak into supermarkets. Uh, you know, I think um, the the competition for online is pretty intense. Um, you know, that's going to be one of the next places to go. I think. Um, uh, where was I? Someone asked me a question there about the Kruv Sifter. I've made, uh, I made a video about the Kruv Sifter. If you search my YouTube channel for Kruv, you'll find my, you'll find my video there. Um, no, I, realistically, it's not going to fix a cheap grinder and make it just like an EK. Um, and, and if it did, you're going to waste just an enormous amount of coffee doing so. So, um, I maybe wouldn't, uh, recommend that. George, is Kibigo coming back? Um, maybe, possibly, maybe. Uh, okay, um, okay, Amin asks, is it possible to detect uh, underdeveloped beans? Uh, is it possible for them to have a crust in cupping? Yes, obviously extremely light roasted coffees don't really form a crust when you when you cup them right if you if you've never done this at home it's it's a fun way to taste coffee you don't need special bowls you can just use uh matching sized cups and and you just brew ground coffee in hot water on top let it steep and when that crust forms on top you stir that scoop it off and then that bowl's ready to taste but very light roasted coffees the crust never really forms on top and it sinks straight away if it's a little bit underdeveloped, it will still form a crust. And, and you may still get grassy or unpleasant flavors in that coffee, but it looks to all intents and purposes like it's fine. Um, unfortunately, the best way to test it is via tasting. That's the best way to detect it. Um, dun -dun -dun. Matthew, thank you. Thanks for coming and, and watching. I will try and do more of these. Um, Scott H, favorite roasters currently? I mean, where in the world? There's a lot of great roasters right now, um, to be honest. Uh, I'll have a think about that one. Um, all of you saying lovely things, thank you. Khaled asks about coffee with almond, coconut, or oat milk. I don't really, I don't really drink dairy because I don't get on very well with milk, with, with the, the cow juice. Um, if you like those style drinks, I think uh, there are now some really pretty good uh, alternative milks out there. Um, whether the environmental impact is a separate question, I don't really know. I, I know the environmental impact of milk in terms of kilos of greenhouse gas per liter of milk, but I don't know for those other ones. And it's one to sort of consider a little bit. Um, but, you know, there's certainly a bunch of, of them out there that taste fine. You know what I mean? I, I think there's a couple of good, uh, Oatly do some good stuff. Minor Figures do some good oat milk now. They're pretty popular. Uh, you know, it's definitely trending hard that way. Um, so they steam okay, they taste fine. Um, they're okay to sort of, if you enjoy them, go for it. I, I don't enjoy the ones 
uh, that have a particularly strong taste. So I've had some coconut milks that, that taste very strongly of coconut and some that taste of almost nothing. I would certainly prefer the latter. What's missing from most of them is fat. And fat in milk is a glorious thing. It does texture so well, feels so good, uh, but it also inhibits bitterness, right? So you'll find that the, that the like um, skim milk, the coffee tastes more intense, but also more bitter than, than whole milk. And that's fat. Um, some, the reason being that some compounds in milk that, that, you know, infants need are naturally bitter. I think particularly calcium derived compounds. And so milk has a natural bitter blocking quality to it, particularly milk fat, which seems to just mute flavor as well. Um, okay, we've got, got a couple of minutes left. Um, Soren asks, will this live stream be available online later? Yes, it will. Uh, hopefully it has recorded uh, at 1080 and um, depending, and this is only 720 I know, so I might re-up this with a little editing uh, afterwards uh, and have it archived there. If the stream's okay at 720, I might just leave it as it is. Um, it's up to you and, and how you all feel. Um, all right, uh, Risky, I'd love to send you some square mile coffee, but not today, but good on you for asking. You know, if you don't ask, you don't get. Uh, ask me again at the next live stream, I'll think about it. Um, and okay, a couple more questions. Um, Jonathan, the question about a business, please come to a future live stream on the coffee industry and coffee business. And I'd love to answer that kind of question then. Uh, Jack asking about plastic and coffee. I don't find that the, the plastic in air presses, certainly modern air presses contribute any negative flavors. Um, certainly not, not, for, not for me. Um, all right, last question. Who wants, who wants to ask it? Whatever it gets asked next, I'll answer and we'll wrap this up. This is your time to shine. I'm waiting. Come on. There's a little lag, I'm sorry for that. All right, now, while I wait for the next question to pop into my live chat, ah, uh, oh, the, the, can Square Marshall to the US? Totally, yes, absolutely. Uh, Michael asks, when is the next live stream? I don't think I can do these every week, right? But I, but I, I feel like maybe every fortnight, maybe every month is reasonable. Uh, I think we'd run out of topics pretty quickly. Um, and, and, and I'll throw some quick answers in there. Ristretto's can be good. They're not just underdeveloped espresso. Uh, rocket machines, there's some great ones. Um, Grandpa, V60 Wave or Chemex. Um, V60 or the, or the Kalita Wave. Um, that'll do, that'll do. Let's wrap this up. I will see you maybe in a couple of weeks. Uh, if you're subscribed, you'll see when I schedule my next uh, live stream. Hopefully a few of you used the scheduling function and enjoyed that. Um, let me know your feedback. Um, you know, leave some comments, let me know what you think. Let me know what you wanna see more of or less of in the future. I'm gonna wrap this up right now. I will say thank you to the, the hundreds of you that came and, and asked questions and hung out. This was a ton of fun. Uh, hopefully I'll see you soon. Thanks again. Bye for now.